Try this again. Hi, um, and welcome to the Green Bank Observatory Observers Workshop. I'm Karen O'Neill. I am the director of Green Bank Observatory, and I get to welcome you guys to this this virtual workshop. Normally, I would get to uh, point out Scott outside and then tell you all about the great, beautiful telescope we have there, but instead you'll get to hear about it uh, through Zoom format, which hopefully will work well for all of you. And uh, once uh, this COVID pandemic has uh, has settled itself down. Hopefully we'll get to see many of you guys in person. So with that, I'm just going to take a few minutes of your morning and talk to you a little bit about Green Bank Observatory and who we are and, and a little bit about our role within the US astronomy community. So we also build instruments, as I, as I believe you heard, uh, that we build for both uh, uh, around uh, the, for, for the GBT itself as for around the world. And then education is a big piece of what we do, reaching out both to, to folks like you guys who teach you about radio telescopes and to uh, teach you how to, how to maximize the science coming off of those telescopes, but also reaching all the way down to uh, very young kids and all the way up to their educators and to, to postgraduate levels. Uh, the point being to, to teach people about science, teach people about astronomy and teach people about the role of radio astronomy within that. So if you aren't aware of this, Green Bank Observatory is actually the original site of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. We've had fantastic telescopes here for over 60 years. The majority of the telescopes that you guys see in these images are still in place. The one exception, of course, is the 300-foot telescope that was completed in 1962 that did collapse due to a structural flaw back in the late 1980s. Uh, that collapse uh, paved the way for the uh, the final design and completion of the 100 meter Green Bank Telescope, which is in the middle of the screen. It was completed in 2000 and is now the primary work telescope that we have here on site. Many of these other telescopes, as I said, are still here. A few are used for education and the rest currently aren't under contract. So this is the, the GBT. This is the view. You wouldn't quite get this view if you were going up the telescope today, but you would get to see a, a similar site. So the GBT is, of course, a 100 meter diameter dish that's fully steerable. And that fully steerable aspect of the GBT means we get sky coverage for 85% of the sky. So the majority of, of the astronomical sky can be seen with the GBT. Uh, the frequency range of our telescope currently goes from uh, the lowest frequency is about 0 0.2 gigahertz all the way up to 116 gigahertz. Uh, the low end is purely set by science. We haven't had any uh, strong scientific interest in building a lower frequency receiver on the telescope. And the higher frequency, of course, is uh, fixed by the atmosphere. Uh, the GBT, as I'll talk about in a little, a little bit more in the next slide, has got an unblocked aperture. And this combined with its active surface gives it absolutely phenomenal sensitivity across the telescope with a good 30% aperture efficiency, even at 100 gigahertz. Um, in all, we have about 6,800 hours that we use for astronomy on an annual basis. Um, this is both open skies time, so this is the NSF funded open skies time, but also used for our various contractors for, uh, for research purposes. So uh, moving on, one of the big aspects of the GBT is the unblocked optics of the telescope. And so you can see here two examples of uh, data. This is not reduced data. This is just uh, raw data coming off. The GBT on the right, and you can see the advantages of the unblocked aperture versus a traditional telescope on the left, where you can see a lot of the streaking that comes about from the blockage in the aperture of the telescope. The other thing you can see with the GBT, this was our first uh, data taken when we went up to 109 gigahertz, and you can just see that the um, the diamonds here are the theoretical fit for the beam, and then the actual data is shown in solid lines, and so you can see that even when we get, went up, first time we went up to 109 gigahertz, we had a very fantastic beam fit. And the telescope, again, is, is uh, performing fairly close to theoretical optimum for what we can do. Again, the frequency coverage, you'll hear a lot more about that, it goes all the way down from a 0.26 gigahertz up to 116 gigahertz. We have mostly a single pixel uh, receivers down at the low frequency end, and then we move to dual pixels up at the higher frequency end to allow you to do atmospheric uh, uh, removal with those receivers. Uh, we do also have three multi-pixel cameras on the GBT. We've got the Mustang uh, bolometer array. We've got a K-band seven pixel system, and we have a 16 pixel system up at 100 gigahertz known as Argus. 
The back end for the GBT is primarily an FPGA and GPU system that's used for spectral line and for pulsar studies, although we do have a VLBA back end as well as continuum back end and some radar systems on the telescope. So that's kind of where we're at now. You're going to hear a lot about that. I want to spend a couple of minutes. Hopefully, I'll be able to get through these. Um, just talking about some of the new stuff coming up on the GBT, uh, some of the projects both funded and uh, um, that we're, we're focusing on looking towards the future. So one of the big projects we have going on right now is called LASSIE. This is an active uh, a laser scanning system for the surface. And the idea behind this is it'll give us a rapid feedback to allow us to reshape the dish and provide much more efficient observing, particularly during the daytime at high frequencies. The project is underway. In fact, if you look at the picture at the bottom of the slide, that is the LASSIE system installed on the telescope. We've begun taking commissioning data for this instrument, and we're hoping to have it fully in use by next year. Another major project we have underway is an ultra wideband feed. This goes from 0.7 to 4 gigahertz. Uh, this feed is being optimized for pulsar work and specifically for uh, timing of millisecond pulsars for the nanograv team. Uh, the aim of this whole system is to have a system temperature of around 30 degrees Kelvin. The instrument is again being built. You can see a prototype uh, that was sitting in the lab over on the right there. Uh, testing is underway for the various components of this instrument and it too hopefully will be up on the telescope sometime next year. Another project underway is looking at just the uh, radio frequency bands within the system and working on digitizing that with the focus being to remove uh, RFI from the signals, particularly when you get to these wideband feeds. You have a lot of RFI coming in and you really want to clean that up as best as possible. So this is an R&D project that is being headed by Ryan Lynch to look into how we digitize uh, the RF and then um, with luck actually put together a plan and begin to, to digitize the uh, the uh, information coming out of our new wideband feed system. And then a project that we're about to kick off this week, we just got the funding for is a new data archive center on the site. So this will be our uh, fi finally give us the ability to archive all types of open skies data that we receive for the GBT. So that includes pulsar data will begin to get archived on site as well. This is a very cost effective mean for data storage. And you can see in the pictures that the building is actually going to be built right next to uh, the Jansky lab, which is where observing happens. And the building itself is just a small RFI shielded uh, room. We're building one of these right now, but we're building the ability to add more so we could actually triple the size of these and have a significant archive storage on site for a very long time to come. <clears throat> Another project we have underway is an X-band receiver replacement. So this is uh, replacing the current X-band feed that's up on the telescope. The intent here is to just uh, basically modernize the X-band receiver. The one we have is fairly old. We're going to increase the frequency range up to 12 gigahertz, increase the cooling capacity, which is less maintenance. And we're also working on improving the baseline stability of this instrument. So it really will be a brand new X-band feed going up. And again, this instrument should be commissioned sometime uh, early next year. So looking not at the GBT, but just some of the other exciting stuff going on, we're in the process of working with the CHIME team to put an outrigger antenna on site. So this is actually putting one of the large CHIME antennas down onto the Green Bank site. This will allow the CHIME team to do a much better job when they're looking for fast radio bursts at actually uh, precision uh, pointing and figuring out exactly where the radio burst came from once we get this outrigger up and running. So we're pretty excited about that and it's fun to see another major new instrument showing up on the site over the next year or so. So finally, looking out into the future, and I know I'm going kind of quickly, but again, I'm, I'm hoping to, to keep this going while I still have network running. Uh, looking out to the future of where Green Bank is going in the long run, what I'm showing up on this slide is just a, uh, the outcome of a workshop that we had a few years ago where we sat down with the, the wider user community to try to understand where the Green Bank telescope should be going in the 2020s. What should it look like and what, what types of instruments in all does the community want to see coming out of us and you can see it's broken down into a few areas you've got accessibility of the telescope you've got the infrastructure that sits there upon which everything else is built and then we have our single or dual pixel feeds that we really want to optimize them and try to get the best scientific performance out of them as possible and then we want to move on and look at radio cameras as well so this is when you want to look at something that's bigger than the, the individual beam on the sky 
You want to become as efficient as possible at looking at those objects and mapping those areas. And then finally, of course, starting to look at the new capabilities coming onto the telescope. What's exciting about this is while the workshop was only held a few years ago, we can really start to show that we're, we're underway with a lot of these projects. I guess I missed one of the check marks, but uh, so the Lassie instrument, as I said, is under commissioning right now. And so Lassie phase one should be up and running hopefully uh, next year. Uh, the data archive, we just received funding for that. So we'll be able to start um, archiving data in about a year to 18 months time, start building on that. We've got a digitized IF. We've got an R&D project underway to look into how we digitize the IF and share the spectrum better. On the optimized feed side, we're replacing our X-band feed in order to um, optimize the science coming out of that. As I already talked about, we've got a fantastic ultra-wideband receiver that's uh, being built right now. And on the bolometer array side, we're now all the way up to Mustang 2. So we have the Mustang 2 bolometer array in full use and getting great science. So that's where we are today. Uh, that's, that's our status on this. Where do we want to go? Looking to the next five years as we finish up those projects that are, that are underway, um, I've circled the three areas of focus that we're starting to look at for the GBT. One is Argus Plus or Argus 144. The other is a new uh, potential new radar system for the, for the GBT. And then the last thing I just want to mention on my slides is talking a little bit about the role of the GBT within the NGVLA era. So on the radio camera side, Argus Plus, now called Argus 144, is a major new instrument that we would like to deploy on the telescope. We just had a workshop about this uh, a few weeks ago, bringing the science community back in to discuss the scientific capabilities of this instrument. Um, slide is slightly off. It says a 10 by 10 pixel. Obviously, we're now up to a 12 by 12 pixel system running from 85 to 116 gigahertz. The idea is to build off of the Argus 16 camera that we have now and greatly expand it to allow us to really just do some absolutely amazing maps of the sky, looking at star formation, galaxy evolution, and so forth. Uh, this is a project that is not yet funded, so we'll be working with the community over the next uh, six months to year to start looking for funding for this instrument so we can really kick it off. Radar systems is another major area of um, research that we've been developing. And I'm excited to say that next month, we're actually gonna be testing the first uh, radar system on the GBT. Now the system we're putting on the telescope is a low powered radar, it's just 700 watts. So this is not something that's gonna go out and um, map asteroids and do, do the amazing levels of science that we'd like to do eventually, but this is a demonstrator project. So this is a radar system we're putting onto the GBT. We'll actually be doing observations of the moon among other uh, sources. And then the signal will be received by the BLBA antennas, which will then process the, the uh, signal <clears throat> and form an image of what we're looking at. As I said, this is a demonstrator to be tested next month. Um, assuming success of that demonstrator uh, set of observations, we're then going to start looking towards funding a much um, higher powered system that works up around KU band. And this will be a system that really will be exciting for the planetary astronomy community, as well as many other users of the GBT. So this is a fantastic new project. <clears throat> and then the last thing I want to mention, and again, I apologize for going quickly, but I did want to make it through my slides, um, is the NGVLA. So of course, the NGVLA is a proposed project at this point. It has not been endorsed by the decadal survey. However, we're hopeful that the NGVLA will be uh, endorsed and we've been looking at the role that Green Bank might have within the new NGVLA system. And just recently, uh, about a week ago, there was a new uh, NGVLA memo that came out, memo number 84, looking at the possibility of moving one of the NGVLA sites uh, from its current location on the maps up in uh, New Hampshire to, or to Westford down to Green Bank. And the conclusion of that was, in fact, Green Bank was a fantastic site to host one of the long baseline antenna arrays for the NGVLA. And so this is something that we're going to be pursuing as well as looking at what other role the GBT could have within the NGVLA system as we move forward to the future and as we hear from the decadal survey to see whether or not that project is in fact going to be endorsed. So those are all of my slides. I'm pleased to have made through all of them without the internet dropping out again. And I apologize for that. I'll stay on for a little bit and if people have any questions, but in the meanwhile, I'm going to hand this over to Will Armitrout, who has a few um, 
comments about the workshop that he's going to give. So we'll all hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Karen. I will share my screen here. And if you do have any questions for Karen, um, save those for the end of when I talk and you can ask us both questions at the same time. So let's share this. Do you see my slide? Yes. Great. So this would be the portion of the talk if you were in person where I would welcome you to the site and lay out all the site rules and, and sort of advertise the natural beauty of Green Bank. I'll still do that in an effort to get you here someday. Um, so Green Bank is nestled in the mountains of West Virginia to be protected from radio interference. And we sit on over 2,000 acres uh, of land with the telescopes sort of strewn across the valley, as you can see to the right of this page. So if and when you are able to visit, we would love to have you here. There's lots of housing on site and it's really a paradise for hiking or biking in the mountains. The only caveat is you can't have any electronic devices anywhere near the telescopes. Uh, there's a gate that, that tells you where to stop. Uh, another logistical thing is that in that email I sent you last week, I included a 10% coupon if you'd like to get any Green Bank swag from our online gift store. Here's another view of the telescope. So of course, this week we'll be working mostly with the Green Bank telescope, uh, but all of them are sort of laid out along this main road here, 140 foot telescope there, the 300 foot telescope uh, was a bit past the Green Bank telescope. And then the chime outrigger that Karen mentioned will be below the 85 one. Some of the goals for the next few days are obviously to become familiar with GBT observing, uh, different observing modes and the user interfaces that we use to control the telescope. The GBT is quite different from many modern telescopes in that there is a lot of user interaction with the GBT. Uh, you, you get to get your hands right into the system and write your own observing script. So that means that the GBT is very flexible in, in what you can actually do um, through any, any Python script basically you can imagine, you can control the GBT. Uh, we'll also have some standard data reduction technique blocks of time for you to work with your project friend uh, through this, this project. So we have seven different observing groups four spectral line groups, three pulsar and transient groups. And so you'll be working pretty closely with, with those folks over the next two days. The goal here is for you to be able to learn how to observe remotely and you'll be signed off as remote observers at the end of this workshop. But again, we hope you will be able to come visit us in person someday. Something about the schedule. So today and tomorrow, we'll have lectures and observation prep running from about 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And we'll all be on this same Zoom channel for all of those sessions. Uh, we do have nighttime observations and each group has their own Zoom link for those. So we won't be using this link. We'll be using those. And, and the name of those is like NRAO room two and RAO room three. Um, don't log on to those individual rooms during the day because there are many other observatory meetings that use those. So you might accidentally pop into someone else's meeting if you get on it before 6 p.m. Uh, some other optional activities we have are on Thursday, all of the astronomers on site have agreed to host a data reduction session from 1 to 3 p.m with their individual projects. So if you'd like to come in and look through some of the data that you take Wednesday night into Thursday morning, that session is set aside uh, for you. And there will also be some supplemental Argus training on Thursday with a time to be announced. That'll be about two hours and led by David Freyer, who is giving the next talk here this morning. 
hopefully you have seen this schedule. Uh, there's a link to it in the emails that I've sent out. Today is really focused on what tools you need to get on to the GBT system and to submit observations. Um, and then tomorrow we'll move into a bit more advanced topics. Uh, what do you need to do to make high frequency surface corrections, for instance, how the GBT is scheduled. And then if you have not already gone through the process of submitting a GBT proposal, the types of tools that we use, sensitivity calculators, things like that, uh, to get your proposal in and hopefully accepted. In the next probably hour or so, I will be sending each of you a message over Zoom with a link to get your account information. We can't send these accounts over email, so this is the way um, that we'll be distributing them. I will send you that link to a document. Uh, please download that document and then change your password sometime this morning. So the way you can do that is using a terminal, logging into the GBT system. And these instructions will also be with that document I send along to you. So that account will be yours and it will not go away right after the observing workshop. You'll have that for at least two years or if you continue using the GBT even longer than that. That gives you access to all of the GBT systems and a, a storage area where you can store observing scripts and things like that. This is just a smattering of some of our key science areas and we have quite a diverse group uh, on this morning. So you can use any of these for inspiration in your individual observing projects or any anything else that you want to think of. The only stipulations for the observing projects are that they um, I wrote in the document, they can't be new science, but really what that means is that you can't use it for um, something that someone else could be putting a proposal in for. You can use it to test out some of your observing scripts, look at already well-known objects. If you wanna study dense molecular clouds, then you might look at Orion KL or some other really well-known clouds already, uh, but we, we don't want to be doing science over the next two nights that might scoop someone else's results that, that they're putting a proposal in for. So that's all that I have to say. We have about five minutes for any questions between Karen and I. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself or put it into the chat.